What's up, and welcome to another episode of Evie's Review. So I know I promised to have some in-circuit chip testing, and that's what I got for you on this video. So let's get right into it. Here's the chip tester. And note that this is the prototype version, so the final one will look a little bit cleaner. It won't have this crazy mess of wires on the back. You see what happened is I made some last minute changes, and so the back cover doesn't really fit right now, but it will fit in the final version. So today I've got a sick Commodore 64. This used to be my main machine, and then it started acting up. So if I turn it off, it'll typically run for about five minutes, and then it'll get this strange pattern on it. So I plugged in my harness. This is the standard diagnostic test harness that you can use for the Commodore 64. You could even build one yourself. I was thinking about building them and selling them, but then I got distracted with this chip tester. So as you can see, Without the harness, it fails a bunch of tests, but with the harness, it gets a U1 error, and that's the CIA number one. And then it fails the control port test, which is either related to the SID or a readout of what comes out of the tape interface. However, the cassette signals actually feed back into the CPU. So from the results I'm getting from the diagnostic, I'm thinking the most suspect chips are the CPU, the SID and the CIA number one. What you'll notice is if I go to basic, I'll get these weird characters on the screen. And that tells me that it might be some kind of ROM failure, but it also might be some kind of intermittent data failure. So why don't we test the chips and at least see what we get from an initial test. So the first thing I'm gonna do is open up this machine, take off the test harness, and I built this even before I had a 3D printer, so you can see I used electrical tape to wrap these things in. So I'll unscrew these guys from back here. So this is my glorious machine on the inside. You'll see that a ROM and the SID are already loose. The other big suspect here really is the PLA because that's what wires everything together. So why don't I start out with testing... Why don't I start out with testing the PLA with my chip clip? So I pop this in here. I select the test, PLA. Looks like it's ready to go. Make sure the computer's unplugged and then attach this to the top. And you'll notice it extends over the bottom, but that's actually okay because there's still room there. So let's give it a whirl. Test. And failed. Huh. It's always good to double check sometimes and make sure that your rig is functional. So I'm gonna try on another machine here with the PLA. Okay, that's failing the same way. So I think there's a problem with my rig here. I recently added a fuse to this tester and that might actually be preventing me from getting the results that I want. I might just need a bigger fuse. So I'll be right back. Back in action here. And I'll tell you, this whole in circuit chip testing, it's wildly experimental, but I've had really good results. So, this is a one amp fuse. The 100 amps is not enough because what happens with in circuit testing is it kind of floods power through the system, which you might think is kind of crazy, but think about it this way if I had to power every one of these chips, I would need a lot more juice than it takes to power one chip. So it's kind of like I'm powering a lot of chips because they're draining through this one chip. If all these other chips were already powered, I wouldn't be draining energy from this one chip. So, I'll pop in this clip on here. I'll give it a test. And look, it says past B. So B means there are some 
pins in the machine that kind of blow down the PLA when you're testing it in circuit. So the in-circuit test on this machine gets a B. And that just means a couple of the input pins aren't quite working, but that's actually okay because 90% of the chip is working, which means it's probably a working chip. So I'm gonna go back to the original machine I was working on here. Okay, press test, testing. PLA passed A, so this is so interesting. So I don't know if it has to do with different revisions of boards or whatever, but this is getting a slightly different result, but it's still a passing result. So if I look at these boards, they're basically the same board, but here's the difference. DCP, whatever that means, HKC. I know HKC is Hong Kong. I'm not sure what DC is. So whenever you have a socketed jet, it's really best just to take it out of the machine because you'll get a more accurate result out of the machine. The in-circuit testing facilitates being less invasive, but it's not a substitute for a full loose test because you'll get better confirmation with the loose test. Go to the test for the SID 6581. Test. Okay, I need a plus at 37 and 40. Testing. Ew. Hey, maybe this SID really is bad and that's why the control port tests were failing. So with the SID out, the machine will still work fine. So moment of truth, I'll fire up the machine. It looks absolutely fantastic. So yes, it actually was that SID that was bad. And my tester confirmed that it was bad. So that's so sad, I lost another SID chip. And I'm pretty sure I know why, because I was using a Commodore 64 black brick power supply, and that is a real no-no. Now I'm actually using this converter to use a Commodore 128 supply on my 64, and I made that by salvaging a power plug from a broken 128 and wiring it to a brand new plug for the 64. And that really works great to use a 128 power supply because they're much better built. But what happened is before I did that, I was using my old brick and I was even using it with a power saver and my machine started acting on the fritz. Actually, a bunch of my machines were on the fritz and I was like, what's going on? Why are all my machines dying? It turned out it was the power supply. So I don't know about other systems, but the Commodore 64 black brick is, from my experience, the brick of death. That's what other people were saying. I didn't want to believe it, but if it kills one of my precious SID chips, oh, it's on. But this is a great incentive for me to start working on a SID replacement. It would probably be an FPGA-based replacement. I know some people use microprocessor-based replacements, so I don't know what direction I'll go. I don't know, might be a year before I do that, but with so many broken SID chips, I think it's the second most common failure compared to the PLA. Also, I am making progress on the corn bit. I put nice legs and sockets on my corn bits. I had to desolder and resolder everything. But I still don't like using these J-leg chips because I've kind of perfected my flat chip mounting technique with the flat chip on the plaster. These guys are still just a huge pain to try to solder on. So I'm gonna be experimenting with a smaller, flatter chip. And I'm also trying to find a way to make it convenient to flash them yourself with like an inexpensive programmer. So I haven't quite figured that out yet, but I do wanna make these available for sale and user programmable at some point. So why don't I go through my stash of known working SIDs and see if I can get something with audio out of it. You definitely don't wanna mix the 8580 with the 6581, because I believe the 6581 are gonna use 12 volts, whereas the 8580 use nine volts. So first I'm gonna go back and redo my loose tests for these SID chips. That one is bad, so why don't I put in the bad one and see what happens? Okay, okay bad SID. Well, the machine works, but... So you can see that the software based SID test fails because those lower numbers are supposed to be random. So I have definitely confirmed that this is not a happy camera. Not a happy city. So I'm 
gonna write another sad face on here. Oh no, would you look at that? So possibly the reason this one's sad is because it actually has a bent pin on the side here. So why don't I test that chip again? So it still fails. One more test. Oh, would you look at that. So, I'm getting random numbers, but you can see on the top, I'm also getting random numbers on the top, which you shouldn't be. Oh, and now I'm not getting anything. And now I'm getting all random. This is definitely getting weird results. It's just up and down and all around. Let's see if maybe I'm getting some audio out of it. I'm definitely not hearing anything. So indeed it is sad. The bent pin is just one more sad thing about it. I've got two more sieves to try out to see if they have any signs of life. This one fails the test. If I put it in the machine. Here you see the danger of putting bad chips in a good machine and vice versa. As I put this SID chip in there, and now my machine is even sadder. I thought I fixed this asbestos thing. So this chip, I'm actually gonna put an X because it seems like a dangerous chip. I can test this Rev4 chip in here. Ew. Pass. Okay, that's weird. Pass. Okay, so this is a maybe working chip. But now I have to investigate why. Oh, there it goes. Okay, that is so weird. So it's as if that. Bad SID chip bombed the machine temporarily, but since it had a chance to cool down from that bombing, now it's actually okay. So now I'm gonna test this supposedly working SID chip. Turn it on. Boots up just fine. Put in the back of the cartridge. And play some music. That's a good SID, I'm hearing some sounds. And just for fun, I can run my little SID test program. And yeah, see, it gets zeros on the top, random on the bottom, that's exactly what it's supposed to do. So, yeah, actually, this is a good SID. And this is the one SID that my chip tester said I passed. So I'm happy to say I've got my SID Commodore working again, because I had a SID lying around that just happens to work. And really the big lesson is, don't use those black Commodore bricks. Get yourself a replacement supply or rig something together like I did with the Commodore 128 supply. And so in the next video, I'm gonna get into even more of these broken machines. So come back real soon. I'll have more in-circuit demos real soon on Evie's Review.